So again, I'm going to make this very casual and kind of laid back. I had to work this morning, so now maybe I can just kind of take it easy and relax. So we covered a lot this morning, and we might retouch on it. If you have some questions about what we covered this morning, raise your hand and let's deal with it, you know, whenever you want to. But I'm going to try to cover some other bases and get even more, drive down a little bit deeper, uh, because... We talked in general generalities, and now I want to get specific. So to start this off, I want you to think about, you all have an office, right? This would be, remember, this is, yes. So you have an office, and you, and from what I've seen when I've talked to a couple of the uh, administrators already, is you usually have a big desk. Would this be true? True? All right. So, and what I've seen at these two other desks is that, all right, so if this is the desk, and we'll call you the administrator, there's usually like two chairs right here, correct? <laughs> this would be your office. I think it's a template for all court. Y'all figured that out and set the template up at one of your previous meetings, I guess. So here's what I want to ask you is, you got this big desk, and yet people go and sit behind the desk. What do you call this desk? Barrier. A barrier between you and the people. Now, if you've got a bad guy or a bad girl, maybe there's a reason to have a big desk between you, but I don't suspect that you talk to the bad guys and bad girls very often. Would this be true? You. I think I'm the judge. Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this right now. When you've got the judge, all right, back in the old days, they uh, put you on a pedestal, so to speak. And, and that they st that's why the judge's desk is usually higher and kind of higher up and everything, because we still put a judge, you know, got a lot of weight on your shoulders, no doubt about that. But again, it's a sign of respect and it's a sign of trust. And you've got the bad guys and bad girls that you're talking to, even though there many times they could be in handcuffs or chains or something, bad stuff happens in the courtroom. So your situation is all right. Is that okay? So we said that. But let's say that if you're not talking with the bad guys and the bad girls, does your administrator come to see you or do you ever just kind of pop in and, and, and who we've got? What Can I see your name tag? Natalie. So let's say Natalie is your one of your administrators. So you just kind of pop in and sit down by the desk, but you've got this barrier between the two of you. How do you feel about that? Okay. I go, I go to his office, he comes to mine, it's all over the place. So I don't, I don't really think of that as a barrier. I think of it when I'm on the bench, it's my safety zone. Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, <laughs> and then it could be a good, another safety zone. Well, and a lot of times you're not, you may not have a big enough office to have, I always suggest if you can get like a glass table that you can see through and put kind of chairs around a, a table, a round table, because you get in confrontational positions. Like when I'm in front of you, and do you mind if I kind of keep picking, do we have another judge here that I can pick on? Do you mind if I, do, should I call you Judge Judy? Yeah, it's actually Judge all right, Judge Jean. So she's got bad people, and when she's confronting them, these are, you know, bad people. So she's in front like this, and I'm the bad person, and I'm in front like this. But usually, though, when you're, like, for the sentencing, all of a sudden, they're not right in front of you, right? So they're off to the side. This is something we can learn, not only from her courtroom and from your judge's courtroom, but if you've got a table that we would call a barrier and you have no other way to deal with this, here's what I suggest. And it was a question that we had on the little quiz this morning. So I'm in Natalie's office and I just came to chit chat with her. And so usually I'm sitting like this, but this is a confrontational position. Anytime you're facing somebody like this, you're in a confrontational position. Your feet are in an H position. Can y'all see this? An H, so they're just like this, all right? So they're just like this. What you wanna do, if I'm gonna talk to Judy and be standing up, well, let's just do the sitting down first. So when I'm sitting like this, I want to get out of a confrontational position. Now, if I want to have a fight or upset Judy, I can stay in this position and know pretty well I have an opportunity to fuss at you and get you, you know, get your cholesterol going and your blood pressure going. But if not, what you might do when you sit down, you simply turn your chair at a 45 degree angle and you watch and you hide. And I will bet you money Natalie will turn her chair at a 45 degree angle also. 
because what that, you know, subconsciously we're saying, I don't want to be in a confrontational position with Linda. And so she's going to turn her chair also. Now, if she's mad at me, she might not turn her chair at all. All right. And then I might go into this humility position, say, well, you know, I really screwed up on that project you told me about something like that. But again, whether I'm there, you know, to just chit chat or whether I've done something wrong, I really want to turn my chair at a 45 degree angle because it takes us out of that confrontational position. The other thing, too, is when I visited these offices, they had very lovely chairs, very comfortable chairs. Now, this is another question. When you have your judge visiting, you want your judge to be comfortable. I would assume, right? But how many people come into your office that you may not want to be that comfortable and you don't want them to sit there and chit chat for the next hour? Does that ever happen? So what do you do? You get rid of your comfortable chairs. All right. Here's the other thing, too, is chairs tell a lot about people. When Judge Jean is, and I hope this is true, when Judge Jean is sitting on the bench, do you have a high back chair? Why? Because the person with the high back chair is perceived as the leader, and she is the leader in that courtroom. You probably swivel. You got arms. When you're talking with people, consider the chairs that you put in your office. The chairs that I saw were high back chairs. Uh, In fact, they were higher back chairs than the court administrator had. What's wrong? All of a sudden, you have power status imbalance. The guest has higher, and maybe, you know, if the judge, that's okay. But, you know, you probably get a lot of other people in your office. So you probably want to have the higher back chair, and the person that's visiting you has a lower back chair. If you don't want to sit, want them to sit for long, you don't put any arms, you don't get a chair with arms, and you don't get a chair with rollers on it. You want to get them the heck out of Dodge. And if you're really serious about that, you, you cut off a, a, like an inch on the front two legs. So they're, they're kind of sitting like this. Cause some discomfort, okay? So think about that. Again, I don't know who visits you, but it's something to think about. What are you doing to enable those relationships? And what do you want, what do you want to do? And how do you want to be perceived? Again, chairs tell a lot about the person sitting in that chair. You had a question. My office is set up like that. And so I actually had, took my two chairs and put them in different positions. Oh, how'd you do? It does well because I put one chair. So my office is, I'm, my desk is here. I put one chair in the corner coming this way, facing out at the 45. Yes. I took the other chair and put it at over here, facing off the wall. When somebody comes in my office, I could tell what the conversation was going to be like. If they wanted to just kick it and say nothing, they sat in the far corner, kind of kicked back. If it was a more personal, serious conversation, they came over there because I would slide my chair over, over to get closer. And, have a, it, and they kind of knew when they were coming in my office that it would be either this conversation or I'm just coming to BS and they're over in the corner and I'm, you know, they just wanted a place to, to get out their own office and do whatever. And see, that's kind of what we talked a little bit about this morning when we talked about the distance when Dexter and I were shaking hands is because there has been a lot of research on distance. So if I want to have that interpersonal relation, oh, I got this problem with my wire, you know, whatever it is, then I'm going to want to move closer to Dexter in your office. So those people probably don't think about when they walk in and say, well, you know, I want to have the serious conversation. Remember, it's all subconscious. So they're going to take that chair closest to be closer to you and be, hey, I'm just in here BSing. Now, something else I want to uh, caution you about with when you visit other people's office, when you go visit your judge, do not, well, let's pretend like this is the door jam of Dr. Jean's office, all right? So do you go in there and you say, well, Dr. Jean, how are you doing? Not Dr. Jean, Judge Jean, sorry. She might not like that. And you don't want to know why? Have you ever done that? Because if you do, subconsciously, she says, that's my door jam. You're leaning on my door jam. Now, it may not be conscious, but it can be going through her head. So, And it doesn't show respect for her office and her door jam and all that good stuff. So if you see people put their feet on their desk, they're showing possession. But in somebody's office, even a door jam is their possession. Be respectful of it. You know, whether you're visiting a district attorney or a sheriff's officer or the, your judge or something, think about those little things. You may never even think about that, but you thought, mm, why is she leaning on my door, Jim? 
And even if, you know, how sometimes you just kind of lean like that, maybe stand like that. Again, even if it's one hand, you're leaning on her door jam. Even if you got a he judge, you're leaning on his door jam. They may never say anything about it, but remember, we might think it without saying a word. Okay? Any other comments, questions? All right. Sitting is, again, when you're sitting across from somebody like this, you should be cognizant of it that you're in a confrontational position and move your chair. The other thing I want you to think about is what do you do with your feet? Like you just said, somebody comes in and to the far chair because they're just going to talk and BS and do whatever, chew the fat. Think, now let's get into the gender issues first because this says a lot about males or females. How does a woman sit? She usually comes in, true or true? How does a guy sit? Dexter comes into my office, hey Linda, what you doing, you know? Men take up a lot more space. Women do not take up as much space. So I challenge women to take up more space. Now I haven't seen, I've seen some people in a dress and some people here might be in a dress. If you go to visit somebody and you're in your chair and they can see up your dress, I don't want you to uh, pull a Sharon Stone deal, all right? You know, so just don't do that. But what you want to think about is there some way can you put your feet in that A position. And remember, an A position is one foot slightly behind the other. So it turns you at a 45 degree angle. So when you're talking with your judge or somebody else, sit in your chair, put your feet flat on the ground in an A position. Why? Because it grounds you. If like, did you play football or basketball? So, you know, they didn't line you up. So you're standing like this because somebody can come and like just push you over. But how did they line you up? Remember like this? Why? Because it gives you more power. You've got lower, uh, what do you call it? Center of gravity. So you could, somebody's not going to be able to push you over. So when you're sitting, come in and, and to do like this, if somebody came over and pushed me, they could just push me right out of the chair, right? So you don't look as powerful when you're sitting there with your legs crossed and you're not taking up a lot of space. So if you can put your feet in the A position, then, you know, if you're talking to the judge, you want to lean slightly forward to show interest. Yeah, we need to talk about the da 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 If you're leaning back, she's going to pick up, well, she didn't like that I said no, she couldn't go to that seminar or that conference or something because we're always talking. So lean slightly forward. I say you can put your hands like on your knees or your thighs, but look where my elbows are, right? And if you take a look at the judges, I haven't seen any judges, and I watch the 6 o'clock news. I don't see any judges up there writing like this, male or female. Tell me, you sit there like this. You spread yourself out. She is like reeking of power, and that's as it should be, right? So again, when you come to call on your judge or talk to somebody else, how do you want to be perceived as like, you know, weak little mouse, or do you want to be perceived as a powerful person? Again, male or female, but at most times women are taught. Now, I'm at the age that my mother said, cross your ankles and put them slightly behind. So somebody else too, right? And then put your hands in your lap. But look at how, you know, confined I am. Doesn't take up a lot of space. So I'm saying, you know, I want to be perceived as larger than life, so to speak. And I want to be perceived as powerful without doing anything illegal, immoral, or fattening. All right? All right. Now, so sitting. Any questions on sitting? Feel pretty good about that? Let's talk about standing. People probably come into your office. When I visited those people, they, they got up and they came around and they shook my hand and everything. And so that was good. If you're standing up to meet somebody or greet somebody, or even if you're in Judge Judy's door, Judge Jean's door, without leaning on her door jam, how do you want to stand? Perhaps you might have maybe a piece, would you have a, like, would you have a piece of paper when you went, or some folder or something when you went to visit your judge, or, so probably have something in your hand, right? Here's something to think about. If you go into your judge and you've got a folder, you've got, and maybe, do you work on iPads? So you've got, this could be an iPad. A lot of times you stand there like this. Have you seen people come to your office stand like this? Where does your eye go? We call this the female fig leaf. It's very similar to the male fig leaf. 
So, you know, if you've got a guy that comes in there and say, well, yeah, or even if they've got a piece, well, yeah, where, again, where does the eye go? You want to be conscious of that because you want the eye on your face, the most expressive part of your body. Now, if you're a female, again, this or holding it like this or holding it like this, they're looking here. And you want to be looking here because you want that relationship. So which looks better, holding something like here, holding it here, or even holding it here? I think this one or even this one. Now, the other thing, too, what if I've got to show Judge Jean something? You're not a first grade teacher, so you're not coming up to, well, see here, see here, see here. No, you're not. So when you do that, when you go up to visit with her, you want to hold the iPad or the sheet of paper, or if you do have a sheet of paper, you can put it in front of her. Now, I suggest, you know, I don't have the, know the relationship that you have, but again, it's even when she's in her office and she doesn't have her robes on, I hope you still just wreak power because it's kind of your job, I, I would say. So I would say when you come over, you keep a respectful distance. Now, you're talking with your judge all the time. Do you get really close? Do you get within like 18 inches? You do? And, and, and you allow that? Is that that's, so it, it just depends on that. But I still think you want to approach them not from this, from the side. Remember, no confrontation. All right. And even if you've got an iPad or something like that, make sense? Okay. All right. Good, good, good. Uh. Okay. Chairs, sitting, standing. I was going to mention standing. So no fig leaf, male fig leaf or female fig leaf. The way to stand is using a power standing position. And what that looks like, you've got your feet in the A position, all right? And it could be either way, because what it does, it just naturally turns your hips at a 45 degree angle. I mean, you know, obviously, physiologically, it has to. Then what you do is you keep your head straight up and down. Then you relax your trapezius muscles. You can bend your elbows at a 90 degree angle, and you hold on to two fingers, one finger, or perhaps even a pin, something like this, all right? You don't want to be slooping down and stooping down like this because, again, that constricts yourself. We want to show our powerfulness without, you know, overdoing it. So you stand erect. The other thing that I want to caution win women on is you can be standing in this power standing position. And then when you come up and talk to somebody, you go, hi, how are you? How powerful is that? Do you ever see the judge on the bench going, hi, how are you, defendant? No, just does not work. So we can take a lot of cues from our judges because of where they come from. I guess it's just, what would you say it comes from? Habit or training or? Our shop judges have to take a doubt. I mean, we have to, we have our judges that are pretty, maybe, they're not really good at that. So it varies from judge to judge. Judge to judge. Okay. Okay, so again, for a woman, and I've seen men do this too, they're, they're, they can be in a very powerful position. They go, hi, how are you? Now, when you bend your head, either one way or the other, that shows friendliness, and there's nothing about it. So if, if I'm your administrator and I haven't seen you over the weekend, I might come and say, hey, how are you, and bend my head to show friendliness and something like that. But you must be cautious when you're doing this. Hi, how are you? Because it doesn't make you look like a very, very powerful person. The other thing, too, is I see a lot of men walking around. We talked about it this morning with their hands in their pockets, right? So they're going, well, hi, how are you? It's good to see you. And they stick out their hand perhaps to shake your hand, but they never take this hand out of their pocket. So where are you looking? at the pocket. So you might be shaking their hand, but you're not getting that emotional connection because their, their amygdala has been hijacked and saying, what's she hiding? What's in her pocket? So be very conscious, a gentleman, is when you have your hands in your pocket. Now, ladies, I don't know. If I, I have to look all over Macy's to find a pair of pants with pockets. I just don't think they make pants with pockets for ladies. So it, it really is a challenge to find some for me to demonstrate that. So most of the time, women don't have pockets, but every man's pair of pants. I don't know of any men that have pants without pockets. And so what's the easiest thing for you to do is just put your hands in your pocket. But again, 
our eye, anybody, uh, anybody's eye will go to what's in your pockets. And you say, people have come up to me and say, Linda, I don't know what to do with my hands. I'm so used to putting them in my pockets. I said, well, this is where you can stand in that power standing position. You could also stand in the humility position. Uh, if we've got, do we have some exhibitors here? Any exhibitors? No. Well, think, um, I was just talking to one exhibitor at lunch. In fact, his partner was in my session. So he came up to speak to me afterwards. And, you know, we talked about this being a defensive position. Everybody agree? So we don't, you know, we know empirically that we don't want to approach somebody who's got their arms crossed. So he came up to me afterwards, and he was talking about a situation, and he went just like that. And so I grabbed his arm, and I said, you are so busted. He said, well, you know, this makes me comfortable. And you got to remember this. This is so important to remember. Defensive positions are comfortable for you. They will make you comfortable because at some point in your life, you felt threatened or you felt fearful, probably when you were quite young. And so you kind of went into this defensive position. And then as you grow older, every time something happened, you went into this position, it became a habit. But now do you really need that habit as an adult? Now, the police officers, you know, they come up against bad guys and bad girls. They need to do extra stuff to be, you know, they wear the body armor and everything. But do you really need that in your job? So when you move into a defensive position, whether it's arms crossed or even if you're just sitting down and crossing your leg, you're changing your physiology and you're changing your psychology. And the people that are looking at you are thinking, Better not go to Nair Linda today. She's having another bad hair day. So they could be saying the same thing about you. So catch yourself in those defensive positions, whether you're sitting down. And I know it's very comfortable. You sit at your desk and you automatically cross your... Can I ask a personal question? Do you cross your legs on the bench? Yeah. Okay, well, it's comfortable. There's so many symptoms of that. I'm really worried about it. Okay, well, because you have to sit there for a long time, too. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a very good question. Thank you for answering that. The question was, is if I'm sitting with my legs crossed, I'm leaning forward, which is very positive, and I'm talking with community hands, very positive, I'm not pointing or anything like that, what's my perception? And we mentioned it a little bit this morning. Most of us can control our body language from the waist up. You get a lot of bad guys that can sit there at the defense table and just sit there like in the humility position and just smile and not and all this stuff, right? But if you look at them under the table, they could be, you know, doing their feet or they might be going something like this because they can't control it. They're leaking of emotions from the body down. So if I'm sitting like this and I'm talking to you, I'm still in a defensive, this makes me feel comfortable, but I'm talking to you and I'm being very open and honest, but I would read the body language. Well, she's talking to her judge and she's very open and being, you know, trying to be very, you know, positive and everything, but she's feeling a little uncomfortable and she doesn't even know it. Yes, ma'am. Well, and, and I do that too, but here's what I do too. If I'm in a room with other people, and you, usually, as you can see, I get hot. <laughs> I'm from Texas. I'm always hot. Um, uh, what I do is I tell people that I'm cold. And at conferences, we know that they keep these rooms freezing cold. So a lot of it, you know, it really doesn't bother me. But if you go out for a break and you're standing around like this and you kind of get a look, you say, you know, I am freezing cold just to let people know that you are cold or you know you could even do something like this because that's body you know you're trying to warm yourself up but i think the issue is so people don't have any misperceptions is you tell them what's going on with you all right and that and that way they know is that yeah and people pick up on that yeah <laughs> do you want my jacket because I don't need it. <laughs> all right. So, all right. We good here? All right. Let's keep going. The other, some other standing positions, if, and not on the judge's, you know, side thing here, if you're standing in your office and somebody comes in to meet you or greet you or something, while they're walking in, or if you're making a presentation, you could put your hand here 
like on the podium or maybe on a desk, and this is for men and women, you put your feet in an A position because, again, it takes me away from this confrontational position with you, and you put your hand on your hip like this, and people say, isn't this confrontational? This is confrontational, but guess what? Which looks better, this or this? This is more powerful because I'm, you're perceiving me as taking up more space. So I all, you'll see me walking around like this or when I was on the platform, I was doing this this morning because I want, you know, I'm not that big of a girl, but I want to be perceived as more powerful and bigger. So you can stand something like this. We talked about the humility position. Stand like this. You can even stand in a modified steepling position, something like this. The lower the steeple the less superior people perceive you to be. Now, as a judge, I would perceive there's sometimes you get up there and you say, you know, you're going away for life or you're a terrible, terrible person or, you know, whatever, something like that. But again, you make a point and you can do this in your own business when you're talking to people. You know, we need to implement this new policy or I really need to get this answer from you today and then take the steeple down and then go into the power standing position, something like this. And people say, well, that's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because you're used to standing around like this, or you're standing with your hands in your pocket or, or doing something like this. So it's about creating new habits. Remember, self-awareness, self-monitoring, and self-regulation. So you start projecting the image that you want and, and projecting the message that you want, that you are a strong, powerful leader, and that makes people become more attractive to you. Make sense? Good. All right. So standing is very powerful. Catch yourself. I see a lot of people. In fact, one of the people, um, we had, I said, well, you know, I got to go. Thanks for talking to me and everything. He came out and he kind of stood by his desk. And then just as I was fixing to shake his hand, he crossed his legs and I went busted. He's not, I'm leaving and he's feeling uncomfortable. Why is that? I was thinking he'd be jumping for joy that I was getting out of his office or something, right? But so think about what you're doing and be willing to change your body movements, but you've got to be aware of it. So you can go out and I can be talking to what Janet. So I'm, that's right. You're another Janet. So I could be talking to Janet and say, well, Janet, how's it going? I have to be aware enough to go, oh, Oh, and look at how my feet or my toes are pointed in, right? If you can see, I have my toes kind of pigeon-toed. When you see somebody with their arms crossed and their toes pigeon-toed in, they're feeling very insecure, and they're, you know, it's a very defensive move. But I have to be able, as myself, is it Janet's job to say, Linda, you're in a very defensive position, and I can tell with your toes pointed and, and you know, pigeon-toeing that you're feeling uncertain about it. What is it? Now, you can certainly do that if you want to, or it's up to us to say, you know, I'm in this defensive position. Is this how I want to be perceived when I'm talking with Janet or when I'm talking with my judge? You're in very, very powerful leadership positions. I mean, I've talked to people, and I know that you have all these people talking to you. I know that you have all these things that you've got to take care of. And again, and your judges depend on them, right? So anything you can do to make yourself feel more powerful, all right, is what's something that you want to do. Yes, ma'am. I don't have any data to share with you. What I want to do is come over and give you a big hug. That would be my first instinct. Um, because I, mm, uh, the other thing, I think you should feel proud of who you are. If, if there's like a, a perception of being too large or whatever, I don't see that you should ever try to shrink yourself at all. I tell this with uh, women who ha are quite tall, and I haven't seen, but I've seen some women that in some of my sessions that are very, very tall, and they slink around, you know, like, I don't want to be taller than a man. So it's kind of a similar situation. I don't want to be bigger than my counterparts or some, another woman in the room. 
again, no data, but I would say be proud of you. You are where you are. You're you're at where you're at, and it ain't going to change in the next five minutes. So instead of shrinking yourself down, which is going to affect your physiology, cortisol is going to hurt you, not help you. So instead of doing anything to hurt yourself physically, you know, stay open and very positive using those positive positions, which keeps your psychology very open and positive. And if you choose to shrink down, lose weight, whatever it is you want to do, then you can choose to do that. But again, you got to feel good if that's going to take place. So uh, don't shrink yourself. Uh, be out there. Be strong. Uh, absolutely. I would not shrink down. And again, if you feel taller, this is something else that happened. Uh, I didn't look at everybody, but I was talking to a woman that was probably came up maybe about here to me. And she was in an office with all men. So what she did when they were sitting around like a conference table, she would sit like this. This is a very sensual pose. You'd sit like this in a bar if you're trying to pick up a guy. You don't, if you're sitting on the couch with your honey, like if you were at home at Valentine's Day, you would want to sit like this with your honey on the sofa because it's a very central position, but you don't do that at work. I mean, if you're the only person in your office, like if nobody comes, you could, you could probably sit however you want to, but again, don't sit like that at work. And if you're in a meeting, don't sit, excuse me, on your leg. She told me that she sat that way because she was so short, even at the ch at, with all the chairs, all the other guys were taller, and she was shorter, so she sat on her leg to lift herself up. I said, no, 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 no. What I suggested she do, and I suggest you all do this, if you're making a presentation to maybe not the judge one-on-one, -on -one, but, you know, like a committee meeting or a group meeting or something, and you feel, like, too short, stand up. Here's what you have to remember. The person who has the most eyes on them is the perceived leader. So when the judge is sitting up there, who are we really looking at? And if the person goes in the witness stand, who's the leader right then? It's not the lawyer. It's the witness because we're all looking at the witness. And when the judge speaks, all the eyes shift and the leadership role shifts. So if you're at a meeting, instead of, again, kind of feeling bad because you're short, stand up because the pe person with the most eyes on them is the perceived leader. Make sense? Okay. All right. So we did standing, chairs. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. I want to talk about colors. There's not a lot of data on colors, but I think colors are important because as women, we, we like to have an array of colors. There is, re well, for the last 50 years, researchers have been studying how men perceive women in the color of red. And when they have studied that, the results are that men perceive a woman who is wearing red as very sexually attractive and central and kind of ready to do the bad deed, right? They did a research study that came out, I think it was in 2014, 20, 2013, or 2014, but within the last couple of years, where now they've studied how women perceive other women who wear red. And I would, we just went through Christmas and all the ho holiday parties, right? You know, six weeks ago or something. What they found, and I know, because I went to some, a lot of women wear red, right? Do y'all have a red dress? You're going to burn it after I tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> or give it to Goodwill or something. When another woman sees a woman who has, a, you know, something red on, and that woman is with her hubby, she thinks, she thinks that that woman may be able to financially take care of herself, but she thinks that woman is after her husband, whether it's true or not. So you need to think about when and where you wear red. If we think about a judge, a judge does not show up in wet, red, red robes. Boy, I'm glad I don't have to say that 20 times. She wears black, very, very sophisticated, very, very powerful color. So think about in your positions, how often do you re wear red? Now, there are some limitations to this study. They only compared red with green dress and a white dress. So they didn't compare it to a purple color or a blue dress or anything like that. So only red, a green, and white. 
And the significance showed that people were not happy with, a woman is not happy with another woman wearing a red dress. So keep that in mind because of your positions of power in the work that you do, do you want to be perceived as somebody who's after somebody else's husband? I don't think so. No. Yes. To wear the red. Well, and again, see, that's what I think is important about research. We always studied men's perception of women, and now this new study came out of a woman's perception of a woman wearing red. And if anybody wants, email me, and I'll send you a PDF of the article so you can, you know, read the whole thing and see. It's it's very, very quiet. It's like, oh, my God. I did have a – in fact, I had a, a red dress and had a red pair of cotton pants, and you know where they're at now? Goodwill. <laughs> they ain't wearing those anymore because I'm a single woman. You know, they probably think about that me already. I, I think things change, times change. And a lot of times, you know, if we talk about Alabama or the red tide and everything, what colors are they going to show up in? Red. But again, you know, they only studied green and white and red. So there, again, there could be limitations on that. And, you know, and then we've got the elections coming up. So who's, the, who's in the red? The Democrats? So, do, and they're going to show up in red. So again, that's just the latest research. And, you know, and they didn't do, they didn't talk about political committees or political campaigns or something like that. But it's something to think about if you're having a, you know, a holiday party or a Christmas party, or even if you go out to play baseball with your team, you know, I wouldn't show up in a red shirt and red pants. I just, I just wouldn't do it. All right. Okay. But that's a good point that you bring up. All right. I don't have anything about colors and guys. <laughs> Do it? Well, you know, what she mentioned about the red ties, and it's true, they always say, you know, men wear these power ties. But how often have you seen um, the candidates in power ties these days? Have you seen them in a bunch of red ties? Not too much, because I think times are shifting and times are changing and more research is coming out. And the other thing you have to remember, too, you, pr you all probably don't. Now, you may be, maybe you won Lotto and you're still working. I don't know. But I would suspect that each of you do not have the money to pay for, like, a handler. When Obama, his first run at the presidency almost eight years ago, he was over in Germany. And perhaps you saw him on TV. He was in front of this throng of people, and he stood up there for, like, 45 minutes and talk like this the entire time. And I watched that and I said, you know, that dog ain't going to hunt. And sure enough, when he got home, the next time I saw him on TV, he was using community hands. So, you know, he, he like, or, you know, the big political bigwigs that have all the money, you know, all those people that are running for president right now, they have all these people watching them and saying, you can't do this in terms of body language. Now, I'm not sure they can control their, their verbal words, but they can change. And remember, George Bush was always like that frown that you know grimace or whatever and towards the end of his presidency remember he started smiling more because it took him a while to change that from this to this so people in those celebrities people like that they have handlers and so they can be there to kind of watch them and say oh you did that again stop it oh you did that again you know we got to start working on that is anybody rich enough here to have a handler or something because i want to get to know you i'll be your handler all right okay so that that's just something to think about it's really about you becoming aware and me trying to tell you as many things as i can about what can change your interaction with the people around you to make you more powerful without you know having to have a title of a judge or something because you have lots of people depending on you how can you come across as powerful with without overstepping bounds okay all right in terms of seating arrangements um does anybody deal with mediators in there you no, no but you don't have to deal with them you don't have an office of mediation. Well, I want to talk to you about how people sit around tables because if you're having a meeting with a judge and maybe a bunch of judges, so you might have three or four judges that maybe report to you and then you've got these other people. So let's say you might have a group of seven to ten people around a table. How do you sit? 
And how do you determine whether you're going to sit? And the question is, what type of table do you have? Do you have like a round, like oblong table, or do you have like a rectangle table? And sometimes these have just been there for, you know, like the last 5,000 years, and you don't have the budget to go buy a new table and chairs. So you're kind of stuck with this. So here's what I even suggest. When you go into a room to have that meeting, you can be there firsthand to say, oh, look, and I'm here, judge. I, you know, I'm very interested in this meeting and, and everything. But then that gives you the opportunity to let other people come in and take a seat. And then you decide where you want to sit. Because if I'm one of Judge Jean's folks and we're sitting at this table, something like this, and everybody's lined up over here and everybody's lined up over here, and this is the last seat, do I want to be in a confrontational position to Judge Jean? But then I know if I'm stuck that way, I can always turn my chair. But when you come to a meeting, start watching where everybody's starting to sit down and the perceived power status person, and we're calling that the judge and, the, you know, the presiding judge in this situation, you watch where she sits and then you take a seat either, you know, at a 45 degree angle. If you can sit right next to her on either side, that's even better. And whether you're having like a committee meeting for NACM or whoever, start taking a look at where you sit. Again, this is confrontational. Turning the chair takes you out of that. If she's sitting here and I can sit here, this is at a diagonal. This is good positive position. If I can sit shoulder to shoulder, that's even better. But again, if you go into a meeting and you just plop down in the first chair, you don't have many options after that. And it's kind of embarrassing to say, well, I think I'll change my chair right now. And people say, oh, what's wrong with Linda? So I want you to think about even sitting at a table for a meeting. Again, standing up. I promised Scott that I would talk about presentations. And so I do want to talk about that. So we talked about sitting down. Something else I want to mention. Let's say if you're going to have a meeting and it's a number of judges and the court administrator and maybe some other people. Where would, do people just kind of, do they kind of walk down the hall together or do they just show up at the meeting place? They just show up? Well, that's good. But let's say that Janet and I met outside my door and we were going to walk down the hall to the meeting. Here's something I would caution you about. Jen and I are meeting, said, well, you know, we've got the, the meeting with Judge Jean, and we're going to do the budget proposal, and we really want to talk about adding more per professional development money to the budget and see if she'll agree to that. So as we're walking down the hall and talking about business, talking about the budget proposal or what, you know, what we want to get out of that meeting, this is not the place to do that. Because when you're walking and talking with somebody, they are watching your movements because it's that old amygdala, the prehistoric brain. And when they see you moving, they're thinking, and I know it sounds crazy, but it's that prehistoric brain that there's movement next to me. Are they going to try to stab me in the back, eat me, or do something like this? So when you're walking with somebody, you talk about social conversation. How's your daughter? How's the grandkids? You know, how are things going with hubby? You know, is he doing fine or something like that? If you want to talk about the budget, you know, whatever you're going to be discussing, have a meeting in your office. Get that stuff laid out. Now, they may have those conversations in the Hall of Congress, but remember how screwed up Congress is right now. So you really don't want to mirror what Congress is doing. You want to have those serious conversations when you're face to face. And so like when Judge Jean is going to sentence, she doesn't walk down the hall with the bad guy and say, well, let's talk about how many years I'm going to sentence you to. No, they are standing right there in front of her. And, you know, it's a serious conversation. So you want to do the same thing. Have the serious conversation face to face, remember? And if you think about, well, I should call him up and, and talk to him on the phone. In some situations, you have to call. Maybe they're out of state or something. But if you can have Skype conversation or actual face to face that's much much better than you know just on the telephone because we talked about the voice situation this morning so then when you get in the office or into the meeting room you sit you know strategically because you've made a decision about where you want to sit in terms of where your judge is going to sit then while you're doing that, this is the time you're sitting down. Again, think about your humility hands. You can use steepling. I highly suggest if you want to be perceived as powerful, you put your hands flat on that table and you don't move them. 
Now, if you have to pick up a sheet of paper or if you have to pass somebody to something, you can certainly do that. But having hands flat on the table or even palms up is very, very powerful messaging. All right? Now, then when the conversation is over, I would be the last one to leave that room. And, you know, unless some people sit behind and they're going to have this conversation, they're looking at you like, all right, we're going to try to have this private conversation. Will you please leave? Then you can leave. But it's always good to see who's walking out together, what's going on. That's very political, and you can see a lot by what they're talking about. And you know what? They're going to be talking business when they leave. Don't talk business when you leave because, again, you've had the situation where you walk down the hall and, and maybe Judge Jean is your, is your judge and she says, well, you know, I want you to do this and I want you to do this and I want you to do this. And so you go to office and you say, now, what did my judge want me to do? And then you have to go back. And then she's kind of fussy because, you know, again, you were watching her movement. So come here going to the meeting, social conversation, no business. Make sense? Okay. No questions? No comments? Can I ask you a question yes. Layout again? Yes. Uh-huh. So in my office, I've got the, the format of an office that you described where I sit at a desk and there are three chairs across my desk. They do have arms, but they're not high back or anything like that. But I find a lot of times people walk in my office, maybe have a minute, I need to ask you a question, sure, come on in. And they'll stand and put their hands on the back of one of the chairs lean on that to have the conversation with me. My my gut tells me to stand up and talk with them, but then that seems off. So do you think, is there a message behind the standing on the chairs, or is it just truly a casual? No, there is a message. So they come in. Uh, they come in the door, and they come up to you, and they go, hey, you got a minute. What is this called? It's a barrier. So they, it may not be any difficult, might not be any something difficult that they're talking to you about, but they feel more comfortable with having this barrier between you and them. I would say, hmm, isn't that interesting? He or she feels more comfortable with this barrier. And you know what I would say? Even if it's just a quick conversation, you might say, well, Sally or, or Joe, have a seat. Let's talk about it and see if you can't get them into that and then see how they sit down and if your chair is like this see if they keep it there do they lean forward do they step if they sit back like this and cross their legs you know they're uncomfortable that that felt better because they were in somewhat a, of a, a open position but remember what we talked about this morning when you lean on the table like this it's very a very aggressive position so this is, hey, look, I'm behind this barrier, but I can kind of be as aggressive and assertive. Maybe they think and assertive, but it's all subconscious. So what you might say is, hey, have a seat and break them out of that habit every time they go in. Do you have to get up and come around if you want to get in the space? So you've got those two chairs here. You're back there. If you want to say, get around, come, have a seat, and you sit right here. And look, at you're in this coordination position with them. Now, do you have time to do that? I don't know, but it's something you could do. What do you all think? And guess what? You're going to cha be changing behavior by that. It's or the start of changing behavior. No, that is helpful because I, I'm new to this position, and it was somewhat of a fear culturally in organizations. So that's helpful to know. I wasn't sensing that it was a power play, but the barrier might be a protection that they're still feeling from what was represented in that office prior. Prior. And again, it is a barrier, but again, they want to be there, they want to talk to you, but, you know, I feel safer behind this. Now, what happens if they come in and turn the chair like this? Remember the old, you know, detective films where they would come in? This, I don't know if they're doing this again. I, I can't remember what they said, but this again, what is this? It's another barrier. So if you go talk to a bad guy or a bad girl, and you this is supposed to be threatening, but it's not because here's this barrier between you and the bad guy or the bad girl. So I've told them, I said, don't sit like this. This is absolutely ridiculous. And um, get them, if they come in and they do this, well, first of all, you don't have chairs that they could do this. Does anybody have chairs like this that they could do this in your office? Yeah, I, I wouldn't think so, but they do in police interrogation rooms. <laughs> So, 
get them out of that because it's it's just simply not good. The other thing too is if you have a guy, now no offense guys, but if you have a guy that comes in and you've got your two big chairs with the arms and he sits back and he does something like this and puts it, this is called four corners, one, two, three, four. This is taking up a lot of space. He's got his hand on your chair over here, right? Again, I would get up and come here and get in his face. Yeah. The other thing you should know, too, this is very interesting. In World War II, when the Germans captured people, guys, soldiers, they would like to interrogate them, especially if they thought they were spies, because what they found out, the British spies would sit like this. And so then they'd sit like a British, take them out and shoot them. The American spies, they would sit like this. So at least the Americans take them out and shoot them. But again, it's very revealing that this is something that they were doing during World War II to see, you know, who's who. And um, so there is a lot of culture that you're going to expect, not the culture of your organization, but cultures within your organization, too. And I... Um, most times, people working in your organization will be acculturated to the westernized version. So, you know, they're making eye contact, they're smiling, shaking hands, you know, if they're kind of learned that stuff. And again, some of them haven't learned that stuff. But you may be even involved in, remember, we talked about how to shake their hand, how to make eye contact. So you probably are going to have a, a lot of workload. Teachers aren't teaching it. Parents aren't teaching it. So who gets to do it? employers, managers. What else? Got another question? How many of y'all do work and you do it on the phone? You do, well you do, a couple of you. So do you get on the phone and do this? And get, what do you, what happens? Speaker phone? So you just hold it, right? Here's something else to think about. When you're on the phone, if you're doing this, remember you're changing your physiology and psychology, right? Because you're constricting yourself. And a lot of times I've seen people and guess what they do? They even pull their knees together like this. And if they're sitting like this, this doesn't work. So they kind of go like this to, to balance themselves. But again, they're changing. Hey, so they're changing their physiology and their psychology. If you do a lot of phone work, I highly suggest that you get a headset. Why? Because if you have it like, well, let's pretend like this is a headset. So I've got this tether to my phone and it's best if you get a wireless one. So you can be walking around your office without having to be sitting there. And you'll find out if you're walking around or if you're not tethered to a phone, you're going to be in a much more open and positive position. So you're empowering yourself to come across as more empowered, willing to take more risk, put, push the envelope out in that manner. So everybody, I suggest headset and also remember the big mirror and you know you could get a really good looking mirror they have them all over the place so I highly suggest doing that also right all right let's see what else I want to talk about oh here's something else we talked about a little bit and I said I'd mention it this afternoon is mirroring mirroring is an evolutionary thing Back in the old, old days, you know, 60, 70,000 years ago, you know, our ancestors, the caveman and all, cavewoman and all that stuff, they used mirroring and evolutionary psychologists know, say that it's true. I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, so I don't know, but I just believe the papers. What happens back then is it was a pretty rough environment, no hot and cold running water and stuff like that. So if you mirrored the people around you, they would give you better food, better shelter, and it's the people that, like even the guys, they would pick certain people, but again, it was about mirroring. So even today, we mirror people in hopes of getting cooperation, in, in, in hopes of getting more perks or more added value from the other person that we want to be in relationship with. If we're talking about romantic relationships, you'll notice, and perhaps this happened if you're married, or still married, in your own relationship, you know, when you were falling in lust, you would just look into each other's eyes and you would just mirror it back and forth and back and forth. And so that lasted for about three months and then things went down the tubes, right? So when you're falling in lust, you, we mirror each other just naturally. But then all of a sudden we start finding things. Well, 
I don't like it because he doesn't put the toilet seat down or he doesn't put the cap back on the toothpaste or he squeezes the toothpaste from the middle. And, you know, we could go on and on and about, on about that. Well, the same thing happens in the office, too, is we when a new person comes to work for us or with us, and even like if elected judge comes, we kind of see, well, what's going to happen here? And so we kind of mirror them for a while. And then I'll say, well, you know, he does this and she does that. And da, da, da. Does that happen? Have you felt that? The thing about mirroring is when we mirror somebody, we're saying, I want to be in relationship with you. I want you to like me and everything. But the problem is too much mirroring can cause some problems also. So even when you get a new person coming into your office, whether it's a judge, whether it's a coworker or something, they could be mirroring you or you could be mirroring your boss. But what you have to remember, if you sit there and so let's say Natalie is my boss and so I'm talking with her and she's sitting like this and let's say she's got her legs crossed like this and I could see them and I start mirroring her like that and then all of a sudden she moves and she does something like this and I do something like this she's going to pick up on that you cannot mirror a person you know movement by movement they sub whether they pick it up subconsciously or consciously they're going to pick up and say something's wrong with linda she's acting really really weird now the other thing that you have to think about too when you get new people in there is if you're sitting around going well yeah let's talk about that what do you think that new person is going to do start sitting around because you're the mirror you're the model you're like kind of like in a fishbowl and i would think everybody is going to be modeling your it's a tough job i mean i wouldn't want the job but again they model you right and if she comes up with if she started wearing all cellophane clothes everybody in her office would probably start wearing cellophane clothes not being kind of ridiculous there but you understand what i'm saying she would be the trendsetter and you in your office could be a trendsetter too so what you say and what your behavior is what people are going to mirror let me give you an example from a sales team I was actually working with a sales group because sales were falling off so i came in and i watched i kind of you know, I was a little fly on the wall. It was shadow for the sales manager. And he would get up and he would fuss at his people and say, you know, you're not showing up like salespeople. You should show up with the coat and tie on as soon as you, you know, you should have that on. You should be fully dressed by the time you get in this office. Because when you walk in without a coat and tie, you don't look professional. Who's going to think you're a profession? And so I thought, I think that's pretty good advice. Sounded pretty good. Well, you know how the sales manager walked in the next day? With the tie around his, you know, how you just kind of drape a tie around your neck. So his, his button was open. He did have his coat on, but here's the tie. So his sales team were mirroring him, yet he was fussing at his sales team for not showing up properly dressed. So again, it's like I mentioned this morning. When you see people doing behavior, and perhaps words, but I don't know about the words. I can only address behavior. When you see them doing something, you need to stop and do an assessment of yourself and saying, am I the mirror for that behavior or not? Because you could be the mirror for that behavior. And it's something that you need to think about. All right. So mirroring is important. You don't want to mirror. Per I'm not going to go into Judge Jean's office and she's sitting here like this and I'm going to go like this. In fact, she doesn't believe everything I'm saying right now. <laughs> but that's all right so again you you do have to be careful all right we did mirroring status and power all right the next thing i want to talk about is status and power now i know in the judicial uh, system status and power means different things when i talk about status and power status is the position you have so like the judge would be like the top dog so to speak and then you know well, who would be next on the on the totem pole the court manager and then da 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 right so that's tower status but also power so we have positional power we have personal power so personal power is your ability to get your team to do what you want them to do but personal power could also be i'm from a different judge's office and i come to you and i say what do i do because i trust your judgment so natalie has enough personal power to influence me so you know power is different but i think what's important is to understand what happens to people of status and power in different situations.
First of all, there's mixed research on eye contact. Now, I think when when judge, the judge is on the bench, she's going to make that direct eye contact with the bad guy or the bad girl, and she can do that eight seconds and feel pretty comfortable with it, right? Because we know that she's not asking him, out, him or her out on a date or something. You know, she's very fussy at him because she's showing up in, in her court. The early research showed that in a dyad, two people looking at each other, the person who looks away first is considered the subordinate of that dyad. So the other person would feel as the power or the status person of that dyad. Now they've done other research and they've kind of counteracted that and say, no, that's not true. So they're going to have to do more research on that. But can I ask you, so when you're looking at the bad guy or the bad girl and you're giving them this stare, do they usually look away from you first? Yeah, because, see, I think it's the original research, and be, and this is my experience also, is they feel that intensity, they know they know they've done bad, and so they know that she is the power status person and they look away first. This is something you might take back to your offices and see as you're walking or talking uh, in a, an office with a people that report to you, who looks away first? Now, something else to think about. You can go up to somebody, and perhaps it's one of your employees, one of your direct reports, and when you first they first come in the room, you make the eye contact for two to four seconds, and then you look away first. And you think, but isn't that telling them that I'm subordinate to them? And I'd say, you know, on first initial meeting, isn't it all right to make that other person feel good? And then, again, you can come back with the eye contact and keep that eye contact. So, and then they'll start looking away second. So it's just something to think about. The other thing too is when we talked about height, we have done research and we know that in a dyad, the person who is tallest, regardless of their positional power, is perceived as the, the uh, dominant person you know, the one with positional power. So you could be the judge, and I don't know if this is, and you've got maybe a court manager that's taller than you, and they perceive him or her as the person in power, whereas you are the real person. Does has that ever happened to you? Yeah. So we know that that happens. So again, people with, with height, don't feel bad about it. Kind of enjoy it. People think you're the boss and you don't want to make your judge mad, but still it's something to think about. So when you're standing in a dyad, don't shrink down. The other thing I think you should be aware of is when you're talking to another person, if you're the boss, so if you're talking to, to your court manager or maybe even another judge that reports to you, if what we know empirically, if it's a serious matter, let's say you've got another judge that did something wrong, you know, maybe he made a wrong ruling or something. She's not going to sit there and say, well, Judge Joe, you, you know, you screwed up, but hey, it's all right. So people in a power situation where somebody else has done something wrong will not smile during difficult encounters. They don't smile. And you'll see the subordinate smiling more than the power positional person smiles. They just don't do it. What we also know is that the person in the power position will also touch more. They feel more comfortable touching the person on the arm or on the shoulder or sticking out the hand to shake their hand, something like that, so that <clears throat> they don't have an aversion to touch when they're in the power position. Does that make sense? Okay. So we've got to think about all these situations. When you're talking with a direct report or even, you know, maybe a peer or something, if there is a difficult situation, as women, we have a tendency to be expected to smile more often. You've got to control your facial features. So if it's difficult, you don't say, well, yeah, this is a real problem. We've got to figure out something. Nah, you don't want to do that. You're not going to see Judge Jean ever do that. Be very serious and be willing to monitor your facial expressions and not go into a smile in those difficult situations. And when you're working with a, well, ex for an example, like at a, a holiday Christmas party or if you're having a, a, a group picnic or something, it's going to be you as the court administrators, the court managers that are going to go around and shake hands, you know, with Dexter and, and everybody around. Now, uh, Judge Jean will be doing the same thing too, but as a person in your position, you're expected to create the opportunity for touch. Now, I want to caution you. 
the higher you go on the arm, the more dominant you're saying, I'm your boss and don't you forget it. But you know, you can go up to people and touch them here and touch them here and touch them here. You know, this could even be when you're doing a two-handed handshake because you know, they've been working in your office for 20 years, you know, them, something like that. If you want to get somebody's attention and you really don't want to feel invasive, what you do is you take this part of your little finger. Now, it could be your left hand or your right hand. It doesn't really matter. But let's say that Dexter is just one of those people, 20 years old, and he just talk, 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 and I'm going... If he says one more word, I'm just going to have to throttle him or something like that. So, and I'm, because we're so cool, I'm not going to interrupt him and say, that's enough, Dexter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have my humility position. I'm going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when I've had enough, I'll take this little finger and I'll touch Dexter. You see how quick that was? That much. I just touch him, but it's got to be the lower third of the arm from here down. Just touch him. He won't probably not even consciously know that I do it, he'll stop talking. Try it. You'll be surprised. In fact, uh, uh, one night I was speaking in New Orleans and uh, the uh, guy that hired my, my client, they, they were having a cocktail party that night. So I went up to the cocktail party and I, you know, he was in a threesome. And you know how you go up to a threesome and you're kind of standing there and you kind of go, can I, you know, cut in? And at one point, it was like, I'm looking at my watch and say, I got to go to bed. You know, I got to be cute, glorious, and wonderful. So I said, I just touched him, and he stopped talking. He said, oh, Linda, you're here. It's like, I, I've been standing here for 15 minutes, and all of it, I just touched him. Go, Linda, you're here. I go, yeah, I just wanted to tell you I was here. I'll see you tomorrow morning. So I was talking about this, this the, the next morning, and he stood up. He said, you did that to me. <laughs> and I go, yes, I did. So it does work. It's a good way to get people's attention without going, <laughs> right? You know, because we don't want to get violent in the court system. That's for sure. <laughs> so think about that. Touch is very, very powerful. This is why you want to shake hands. And then again, you're not going to reach across to the bad guy or something, but you know what I mean. Do, could I ask you, not, when the attorneys come into your office, do you ever shake hands with them? Some I do, some I hug. Oh, okay. <gasps> Let's talk about... <laughs> This is perfect. Can we talk about hugs? Do you want to talk about hugs? Does somebody, like I'm from Texas, I hug everybody. We talk about hugs? Dexter, can you help? All right, all right, let's, let's come up here. Let's show them. Now, hugs are interesting because you can now look at people hugging right up here and tell whether the hug is sincere or not. Remember we talked about the genuine and disingenuous smile. Well, there's a genuine and a disingenuous hug too. So what you want to look for, and there's a personal hug and a business hug, all right? And I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna demonstrate both of those. So the first we're gonna do is the personal hug and kind of get that over with, because I get kind of red and everything. So, but what you want to look for is how far apart the hips are. Now, what was interesting was this morning after my program, when Mary and, you know, the two women got up there on stage, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, Carolyn, I was watching, you know, when they were hugging, you know me, I'm watching all this stuff. They had a very genuine hug. Did you notice that? Because their hips were together. So let me show you a disingenuous hug. So you stay right here, lean over. All right, lean over. All right, you see this? Look at how far apart our hips are. Look for this when you're hugging somebody because, you know, a lot of times you may see this personal hugging in, in business, you know, a lot of times, and I'll show you the business hug in a minute, a lot of times you don't, but you can always tell whether that's a sincere hug or not. And this might be kind of interesting for you to see if your lawyers are sincere or not. All right. So that was an insincere hug, right? Because we've got a huge width. Now here is the sincere hug. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. You see how close our hips are? Ain't no, this is like full Monty or something, right? <laughs> so you, and this is what those two were on stage. I thought, that's a sincere hug. Now, don't get me wrong. If you've got like a little kid here or something, you've got to lean over, you're not going to get your hips up. You know what I'm saying? Or if you've got somebody that's a lot shorter than you, physiologically it's not going to happen but in even with tall guys you can get right up close to them and have a sincere hug so you can always tell and something else to think about you watch these love stories on tv or in the movies and you know these actors are supposed to be madly in love and then when they hug they go oh i love you dear and they're and i go 
they paid him for that. So start <laughs> watching that. It's very, very interesting. All right, so we got the personal hug out. That wasn't too bad, was it? So what about a business hug? We see business hugs more and more because, you know, we got a lot of this stuff about harassment and everything like that. So the business hug, you still look at the distance between the hips, but this way you're only going at it from the side. So I come up to Dexter, I'm so glad to see you. It's great. Yeah. You know, I don't care about Dexter. He's like, Ugh, you know, I just, everybody's watching. So I want to put on a good show. So that's a very insincere hug. But if I come up and say, hey, Dexter, and you see our hips are touching. That's sincere. Now, does this always work? Let's say Dexter's, you know, we're out on the exhibit floor and Dexter's got like a bag of, you know, stuff and he's holding it there and it gets caught up. So, you know, don't make this a science or anything, but you can tell when people are sincere is when they get right up close. A lot of times women will put their head like here. Think about that too. Again, you're bending that head. Is that how you want to be perceived? Just stuff to think about. So, Let's give Dexter a big round of applause. Thank you again. Okay. So, have you learned something? All right. But you don't have many questions. I thought you'd have more questions. Oh, we got, all right. Oh, that's an end. All right. So what if you, what if I'm flirting too much with Dexter and, he, you know, he thinks there's some more interest than what there should be, right? You know, I always tell people in situations that you want to stop to give them the finger, this finger. Okay. Now you can also, you know, this is where you can use your verbal and your nonverbal communication. Because if you get in a situation like that, it's probably because your nonverbal communication was sending a message, whereas your verbal message was sending a different. So it's a, you know, a disconnect. Men, you got to think about this. Men are, have more acuity in terms of reading nonverbal communication from a woman. Because remember, they're the hunters and the gatherers. And the, oh, is she interested in me? Is she interested? Oh, uh, she'd be, oh, I, right? So they're always on the lookout for open. And remember, if you're wearing red, that's a no-brainer. So uh, again, take a look at your body language. And you might have to, again, change your body language. And, you know, put up the stop sign and say, you know, I appreciate your interest, but it's just not going to work for me. Does that answer your question? No. Well, you, you may come across it. All right. So this kind of gets back to large sizes. We don't have a worthiness feeling or a high level of worthiness. So we're always trying to caretake and take care of and be warm and loving and giving and giving and giving. And you may just be exuding that when you don't need to. I mean, you're worthy regardless. And if somebody checks that wrong, again, you can stop it with your nonverbal behavior or your verbal behavior. Okay. I'm, if we go to Mona, and then we'll get Dexter. We have about 10 minutes left. I don't know if this happens sometimes when you see the answer of Dexter. He just says about six times. Or oh. Like Deception. All right, and then we'll get to you, okay? Is that Deception is very interesting. You know, you've seen on TV these human lie detectors. Well, are you a human lie detector? And you see the bad guys and the bad girls every day, right? So would you consider yourself a human lie detector? because you see them every day. Now, I have not seen any studies on judges, but what I do know is most people, us, are only 50, have a 50-50 chance of detecting deception. Now, 
if you're living with the person like your kid, your grandkid, your spouse or something, you have a pretty good chance, more than 50% of detecting deception, unless you're in denial and you don't want to know that he's having an affair or she's running around on you or something like that. But again, people... The, it was the Secret Service and homicide detectives who faced criminals, bad guys and girls, almost every single day that had a 77% chance of detecting deception. 77%, not 100, 77. And I would think with your, as many people as come in front of you, you would fall into that, but I don't have any data. But now what happens, what was interesting, is they did a follow-up study. And when those homicide detectives were promoted to like a desk job or I don't know what they'd get, you know, where they weren't out on the streets and they weren't arresting the bad guys and interviewing them every day, guess what their deception detection rate fell to? 50-50. So you got to live it every day. You got to be in on it consistently and you do have a much higher detection rate, but you, n nobody's going to be like at a hundred percent. So, you know, reaching close to 80%. And even though they train police officers in that, you know, unless you're living it every single day, it's very, very tough to detect deception. Most of us have a 50-50 chance of detecting deception. Now, one thing I will caution you, if you're, now I do this with my sister. My sister is, is funny. She, she wants to build herself up and feel good and she'll tell me these little white lies. And as soon as she tells me these little white lies, like my antenna, you know, have you ever felt that? you're probably detecting deception. But you know, if I walked up to you at the exhibit area and you told me you were gonna win, be the Miss, next Miss America, I'm going, right, no offense, you know, I hope I'm not offending you, but you know, we can just tell. So when you feel those little antenna, you might want to, and I have no data on that, that's just my own personal experience, you might wanna give some credence to it, but if not, again, 50-50 chance of de uh, deception detection. The other thing you might have to remember too, as I mentioned this morning, NLP had that thing, you know, it's been around for years, and if you look up to the left, you're, they're lying. If they look up to the right, they're telling the truth. That is not true. That has been debunked. You know, we, we talk about learning styles, and the visual person is either looking up to the left or the right to create a visual image, but it has nothing to do with deception. So you cannot use that as a way to detect deception. And you've got to remember too that the bad guys and the bad the con men and the con women they got their stories down straight they can sit there and look you in the eye and say yeah i'm gonna well look at bernie madoff i'm gonna get you a hundred million dollars in the next two weeks oh and you gotta go with me if you don't go you know and so the bad guys and the bad girls they know about this stuff and they know how to use it to their advantage so just because a person doesn't look you in the eye does not mean that they're lying because what we know is innocent people when they're taken in by the police for an interview they get more fidgety than the real bad guy or gal all right and they won't make as much eye contact as the bad guy because the bad guy not all of them but you know a lot of the bad guys particularly the con artists are trained in this information all right all right does that answer your question And, I, and there's a reason I said it. My daughter always says to me, Dad, I'm not your employee. <laughs> you know, because I'll do the eye contact, I'll, she'll be, I'll tap. You know, I do certain things with her. She's like, Dad, I'm not your employee. And, and I realized I'm not at work anymore. And so I kind of kind of have to, you know, because you talk about positional power and, and authority and everything. And so we carry a persona and, and a certain thing about us, but then sometimes I still like that. And it's like you, sometimes you just want to shut it off. My but, mother told me one, that one time not too long ago. She goes, I'm not one of your inmates. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I was the, doing the, it. The, 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 and I, I didn't realize, realize it either. I, sometimes I didn't realize, you know, I'm looking at her. Like, I have a conversation. And the worst thing I was telling you about the thing. I put that phone down. I'm talking, we, we having a, you know, and, and she'll be like, I'm not, I don't work for you, Dad. You know? <laughs> but here's the thing. Is that so bad? And... You know, in your position, you've got your daughter. 
she's you say put the phone down so we can have a face-to-face -face you know she wants to be taking a picture and sending it off to facebook or instagram right which doesn't create relationships and you're trying to teach her and i if i were in your position and you know i can only do the four-legged kind i've never done the two-legged although i'm a wildlife rehabber so you know that's what i do um but for your daughter are you are there, how old is she if you don't mind me asking well, so she's been, has she been to any, any programs in college or high school that they don't, they're not teaching them this stuff. So see, you're like the ultimate teacher. And, you know, you could, instead of saying, well, dad, turn it off and say, you know, you probably want me to turn it off. But, you know, when you get into your job or when you go to the office, I want you to have more skills. I want you to have higher emotional intelligence than anybody. And I want you to get the first promotion. So I'm not going to turn it off for you. I'm going to keep it on because I'm your dad. I, <laughs> when we get done with this, it'll be off. But see, right? you're, you're teaching her what nobody else has been willing to teach her. And I got one last plug. You know the hand touch? Come to the networking suite tonight and interrupt the conversation. We did that too. Yeah, we yeah. Open 7 to 11 in the Jubilee Room. And can I say one thing about your mother? When my mother, she was such, she's gone now, but she was such a pistol. And, and she would tell me that, you know, she would my mother was the depression baby so she grew up in the depression and everything and, and she suffered as i'm sure your mother and, and a lot of other people did and so she has a pessimistic bias and a pessimistic bias is a person who sees everything as negative you know so if she had to pay some income tax she said oh god linda i had to pay income tax i can't believe i don't know how i'm going to survive you know and i was listening to all this stuff and i say mom tell me something good she says linda there is nothing good and you just get off your high horse does that <laughs> you know some things you just can't change but i did i kept saying mom if you can't tell me something good, I'm going to hang up. And the first time I told her that, and she kept going, oh, I had bad cards at Bridge. I had bad this, you know, person in front of me. And I said, Mom, if you don't tell me something good, I'm going to hang up the phone. She said, you better not. I hung up the phone. She didn't call me for three weeks. And I would, you know, all this stuff. And finally, she called me back. And guess what? She had something good to say. So it's about, she was brought up with a pessimistic bias, so she saw, saw everything through a negative perspective. And I think what we've got to do is we've got to change people's perspective and see the positive perspective of, of where they can come from. But again, is it going to be like, you know, something's going to come, a spaceship comes down and zaps everybody and they've got this positive bias? No. It's going to be people like you working with your daughter, people like you working with your, your staff members, you working with criminals in your court to see if you know we can change their attitude and give them hope instead of you know whatever uh to create more positive bias in a situation like that will it work all the time no no but again you can try it worked with my mom but again you know it nearly killed me <laughs> three weeks of sweating straight so i've got three o'clock did you learn something yeah. did you have fun yeah. well thank you so much I love talking about it. I am starting a new research program in the spring. I think it's going to be April or May. And what I'm, my next project is, I'm looking at, I've looked at the seven hand gestures. The next, I'm going to look at seven more gestures. And now I'm going to get into the male fig leaf. I haven't looked at that. I'm going to get into the, uh, fem uh, you know, the female fig leaf. And I can't remember the other ones. So you've got to think back. Remember, I said this morning, Paul Ekman in 1969 in Friesen said there's only six facial expressions. Well, now we know there's more. And so before people said you can't articulate different hand gestures, you've got to look at everything in clumps. Not true anymore. So the research is changing. And so hopefully if I come back to talk to you guys in the future, I'll have more research and data on what gestures actually mean. Do they mean that people want to talk to you or do they mean they want to get the heck out of Dodge? So that's going to be my next program. If you didn't give me your business card or your email address this morning and you want to get on my mailing list, again, I only talk about leadership and body language issues, give me your card or your email address and I'll put you on there. And it's a way to just kind of reinforce this it comes out twice a month i say share it with anybody that you want with your staff members a lot of people you know put it into their you know internal organs in their organizations because i think we've got to get the message out there and you know we can't put it on everybody's shoulder so 
that would be my suggestion. Give me your business card and we'll keep you informed. So I want to thank you. I'm, are we going to go to the exhibit hall next and see what they have to say? Oh, exhibit hall isn't open now? Oh, all right. Well, then I'll see you when I see you. Thank you, guys. I enjoyed it. It's been my pleasure.